Kevin needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, he really is now Mr. Big in ballet in the United Kingdom. Uh, actually, more than that, it's really one of the great, great roles um, in, in the dance world internationally. So, Kevin, you're very welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Um, We're going to start, funnily enough, at the very beginning. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your early life? My, my mother was musical and, and had, had training in uh, singing, and she also played the violin, and she's a great pianist. And so there was that musical side of it, but no dancing, really. I think one of the things um, about them was that they, for my mother, when she was quite talented, I think, and some teacher suggested that she goes, they, she lived in a town called Lurgan, and said, oh, she should go for classes in uh, singing lessons in Belfast. And of course, her parents, who were quite a bit older, I think, at that time, said, Belfast, it was 12 miles away or something, you know, it was too far. <laughs> and so I think for, with us then, because when people started to say, oh, maybe you should do this, they always wanted to give us the opportunity. So we're very lucky to have had that. It's interesting uh, that you have a, a brother who's followed a very similar path to yours in, in, in terms of career. We were very lucky in the sense that we we're five years apart, and Sir Michael was my big brother, and uh, so he was doing everything first, and I was interested in what he was doing. So when we started to do, um, we, we, did, we went to a teacher called Jean Pierce in Leeds, and she was a fantastic uh, theatre, really, um, dance teacher. And so I had a lot of connections in uh, TV and uh, in a different sort of uh, musical theatre world. And so we started to do shows, and uh, Michael was a regular on a show that some of the older people might remember. There was this thing called Junior Showtime, and Michael was on that. And then I actually went on it as well. And uh, then we were both in the, in the film Bugsy Malone. And so, but it, Michael sort of tended to do everything first because of the age. And then actually Michael got into ballet sort of first as well. And so I just sort of followed along really. And uh, I, I, I never dreamed that I would be in ballet really. I was always mad keen on tap. I was an okay tap dancer, but I just like theatre, you know, that sort of thing. I was very small. I from, uh, was probably about four foot. 10 to about that I was. Well, when you were 18? Yeah, near enough. <laughs> 15, 16, 17. And at White Lodge, they were very concerned. And I, I, um, I, they kept looking at me. And of course, at the time, Wayne Sleep was, was the big, <laughs> big in the, in the sense that everybody knew him and he was the great dancer of the company. And, but everybody kept saying, you can only have one Wayne Sleep. And uh, so I was at this height. And so they took me for a, a height test. And I think they still do it. And, and what they do is they measure the, the, I think there's a gap in the wrist, and the bones in the wrist, and, they, and depending on how big that gap is, they, um, they, they can tell what height you're going to grow to. And so I went for this, and I always remember it was 50 pounds at, in the 70s, which was a lot of money, you know, at the time my parents had to spend that. And they came back and they said, oh, you're going to be anything from five foot to six foot. And so we're all like, well, <laughs> I think we could have all you know, said that. And so then the next year, I still hadn't grown. And so then they said, uh, go for another one, so another 50 pounds. And this time they did say 5'11", which um, I had to wait a long time to get there, but actually I did get to 5'11". I remember also, we, uh, White Lodge is very different nowadays, but at that time, you weren't, your parents weren't allowed to come anywhere near it. You know, they dropped you off and that was it. They never saw a class or they never saw anything. But apart from one, the very last term, you're allowed to bring your family to watch a class and they did a little demonstration. And at the time, we had a, a great aunt of mine was a, a nun and uh, she was called Aunt Minnie, funny enough. And she was literally three foot. I mean, she was that high. <laughs> and she was over from Ireland. And so, she, you know, my parents wanted to invite her, but my mother kept saying, don't let them see your heart. <laughs> because you're never, never going to grow, you know. And uh, poor Aunt Minnie was sort of bundled away and uh, sort of. But anyway. So, so tell us about, I think, uh, Vera Skelton. Uh, Louise Brown, Jean Pierce, all yes. people who have had great influence on your yeah. professional life. It was sort of weird. Um, 
we, at one point we were going to move to Leeds from my father's business and so somebody had said to my mother, oh there's this great teacher in Leeds, you know your son's uh, and your daughter are dancing and um, she, she would be somebody worthwhile going to see. And so we went over and started doing classes. I, it's all a bit vague to me, but um, we, so we started going to Jean Pierce, and there was also a, a lovely <coughs> Miss Winifred there as well. And uh, we started going to classes. So we went twice a, a week from Hull to Leeds, and uh, it's quite a journey, and sort of mad because we never moved to Leeds. And so we did this for about five years, going backwards and forwards. And then I sort of got the ballet bug and I, I could see well, the more I did of it the more and the, all the different teachers I worked with like in Ilkley and Louise Brown and I could see how exciting it could be to be a ballet dancer and, and it was at, actually at Ilkley that uh, somebody suggested maybe that I went and auditioned for White Lodge and, and my parents sat me down and said are you interested in this and I said yes. And so you auditioned uh, and you got in. Yes. Um, was that a, a big change to your life? What, what, what are your abiding memories of that period? Yeah, I think it was. I think one of the good things, of course, about somewhere like that is, uh, especially considering what we were doing, traveling to York, traveling to Leeds, traveling to Ilkley, it was all in one place then. You know, you were there with people that all wanted to do the same thing. Luckily, um, I never had that. In, we weren't really teased at school. I think because of the television and the the Bugsy Malone and all of that, we it was sort of seeing heroes. Yeah, it was it was yeah. fine at school. So I didn't have that problem, but it was lovely to be with everybody that wanted to dance and a little bit homesick. But Michael had gone to the upper school at the same time, so he was around. So I was hearing all the stories from that, and so really, and we both had the same teacher actually at the same time, Ronald Emblem, who I'm sure a lot of people know, and uh, and so he used he would compare us slightly and, and bring stories back from either the upper school or the lower school. So it was nice. It, it didn't feel such a, a trauma to go to White Lodge. In my s the second year of, of White Lodge, so I was third year, they suddenly decided that they, we always did uh, Morris dancing and things like that, and uh, Scottish dancing. Michael Clark famously used to do the sword dance. Um, he was from Scotland as well. And anyway, they decided to do Irish dancing, and I and I think because maybe just because of my name, or they thought I might be good at it, um, they I did an Irish jig, and uh, a three uh, a trio, two girls and myself, and we were tiny, so I think it did have the cute factor, and <laughs> and we did it at the Royal Ballet School show at, at Covent Garden, so that was my first little um, outing for you know, at the age of. 12, 13, doing this uh, Irish jig, and we, I think I did it a couple of years, um, but it was, of course, exciting to be on that stage and, and be a part of it, and uh, maybe, I probably would have made a lot more money if I'd gone into river dance and <laughs> done a bit of that, but uh, I don't think I was quite... You, you might not be director of the Royal Ballet yes, if yeah, you had that too. Um, you, were, you were then accepted into Silas Wells. Uh, Royal Ballet, and you were there at a very interesting time because it became, while you were there, Birmingham Royal, Royal Ballet. Um, and, and I've seen in interviews, you, you talked a little bit about almost being part of three different companies, but always having been with the same company, first on the big right. Um, to tell us about, about your early days as a professional dancer. Um, it was great. I was, you know, I did, uh, I was so thrilled to join Sadler's Wilds, and of course, Michael had got it into the company five years before, so uh, he was already established as a soloist, I think, uh, by the time I got there. And um, so I knew the company very well, I knew all about it, so it was the place that I was very happy to be in. And for the first two years, actually, I, <coughs> I just enjoyed myself being a, a court of ballet dancer, really, and I, I think I worked hard, but I... I remember Peter saying to me at one point, are you ambitious? Because I think I'm quite laid back anyway. And I think he probably thought I wasn't really pushing forward as I should be. And, uh, and I think it was probably at that moment, it was about after two years, and I thought, okay, obviously, <laughs> I have to notch this up a gear and, uh, and really do that extra bit of work that you need to do if you want to progress in a company. 
and probably at the same time, you know, I, I was then taller, so that obviously adds um, up to um, to helping you get maybe progress because we're always looking for tall men in, in ballet companies, and uh, and I really. Uh, just before my last year at the UP school, I was lucky enough to be coached by Michael Soames. And, and I'd always been small and skinny and uh, hadn't really partnered very much. And he really, I did Sleeping Beauty Act 3 uh, for the school performance, and he really coached myself. And I danced actually both with Viviana and Miyako in that, in the school show. And he, he, scarily, <laughs> it was very scary, but he brought a love for partnering and, and uh, the love of making that work and how important that is because if that, if that works then you're set up for the, the, whole, the whole thing. And uh, so further on, there's two years down the line also, I was having to then do roles that were generally partnering, you know, when you first start doing stuff, and I could partner some of the taller girls. So I think that also helped, and I, and I worked on that a lot. And then also, you know, David Bintley started to choreograph, and was choreographing, and, and started to choose me for things. And I think Kenneth, there was a, Kenneth came in and did a quartet, this ballet. We revived it, and I was chosen to be one of the big partner parts in it. So started to get a feel of parts, and then, then it was right, okay, push on ahead really and then it was really down to business and uh, quite serious. And was the, the change from the move from London to Birmingham uh, and, and that must have just fundamentally changed the company, was that a difficult time for the, for the dancers? I think initially it was, we, I always remember we were in Oxford, um, we were doing La Fille Margade. Derek, who's at the back there, I think you will remember. <laughs> he, uh, Derek was on the management by that time and would know all about it. but. They called us all together before this show of La Fille Margale and said, um, we need to uh, tell you something that there's going to be a uh, sort of uh, inquiry into, or a report into whether uh, the viability of taking the Sabbath's World to our ballet to Birmingham and to become a company in Birmingham. We didn't know what it would be called then at that time. And of course, we all knew that the old Sabbath's World was tiny. Uh, there were, the studios were pretty horrible, the dress rooms were awful. We couldn't do any of our big productions there because they were too big. And, you know, we were already in Birmingham, you know, Sleeping Beauty, I think the year before had just been premiered in Birmingham first. And then we always had to go to Covent Garden to do those ballets because we just, they were, the stage was so small. And so um, I think we all had a bit of a heavy heart that day. It probably wasn't the sunniest performance of La Fille Margarde, but. <laughs> But I think because in the back of our minds, we all knew that probably it was the best move for the company um, at that time. And so it did change a lot. I mean, I think about, in a way, I think due to, you know, probably Peter Wright and, and everybody, there wasn't, about 15 people, I think, left the company. But that's quite a big amount of people out of, I think the company's about 60 at that time. So, um, it was a hard move, but I think once we got there um, and saw the facilities and and felt the warmth of the audience, I think what we'd been worried about was also when we went on tour a lot of the time we hadn't sold out, and so we were thinking, gosh, is there anybody out there that really Thank wants you. to come and see us? But I think immediately that first season there was definitely a, a buzz about the company being there. Of course, they already had a great orchestra there, and and the the thought that we could do much more and have much more ability to, to do bigger productions and studios to work in that would really um, help you progress as a dancer. So I think, uh, I think in the end we all knew it was the right decision. We loved it. Tell, right. tell us about your, your, some of your favourite roles. I, I know there was Ed, Ed was second, that there was yes. Far From The Mudding Crowd, and I, I think Bintley gave yes, you a sort of yeah, a new feel about it. Yes, your that's right. I mean, I think I was lucky enough, as you said earlier, it did feel like three companies because there was the Sanders Wells Royal Ballet period, which had a lot, of, what was great about that is we did loads and loads of performances, constantly touring, loads of new ballets all the time. Some of them worked, some of them didn't, but you were constantly working with choreographers, new work, and which was really fantastic for me. Plus, 
we, you know, the classics were there, and I was getting to do those. When we got to Birmingham, there was it, it seemed more stable in a way, and and things like Kenneth came and put on Romeo and Juliet, which I was lucky enough to dance, and and did become a, a really a favourite role. I actually I wasn't scheduled to dance the first night, um, and uh, of the new production, and they'd actually it was sort of a little bit awkward because. Famous, I think a lot of you will know that the yeah, Covent Garden originally was created on Lynn Seymour and um, Christopher Gable, and then the board insisted that Margot and Rudy did the first night, and it was always a little bit of a sore point for everybody concerned, really. I mean, including Kenneth, and uh, and then we got the production to come to Birmingham for the first time, and they brought in two Russians to do the first night. And so that was a little bit of a, so we were all lovely, but we, we were, I think it was, it was a little strange. And I can't, I don't really know why that had happened or whether Kenneth wanted it or, or what. But anyway, it was Nina Ashnavili and her partner. And uh, her partner got injured um, about three days before. And uh, so I remember Kenneth ringing up and saying, it's you, <laughs> get down into the studio. And so it was quite amazing to dance with this incredible ballerina, you know, from, uh, from uh, the Bolshoi. And, uh, and it was a great experience. They had decided to do, um, that's why I say it eventually became my favorite role, because in this, it was new designs. And the designer was a very talented young man. And, and with Kenneth, they decided they really wanted this sort of uh, Renaissance look. and, and uh, I had, well, most of us had quite short hair, and so they decided that we all should wear wigs for this, and long wigs. And all I'll say is one of the reviews said it was the worst wig seen outside of Russia since 1950, <laughs> or like. and it was horrendous. And I remember on the first night, he just kept going like this while, as I was dancing, and she kept coming back to me and sort of doing this straight me. And, uh, and Kenneth was naughty, actually, because he knew we had, we'd done the dress rehearsal, and he said, uh, he came back afterwards and it was very it was very nice, he was really pleased and he said, But we'll sort out your wig because it's not working. And so the next day I went to him with and I'd got the he the Henry, our wig master, to to give me a pretty awful wig. And I said to Kenneth, Look, this is what they're suggesting. Do you think really we should sort of ditch it? And he was like, No, 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 I love it. <laughs> and so we had to wear this wig and he he even came in before the show to check that I had because the wig and of course I was uh, a good boy, I did what I was told, you know, but I'm sure in other, other dancers might have just ditched it before the show. Anyway, I, I did only manage to wear it about three times and I grew my hair for about three or four years just so I'd never have to wear this wig again. But that was a great role. And then when David took over the company, um, we'd already, of course, done a lot of his works, but um, I created uh, a, a full length ballet, Sylvia, with Miyako, with him, and then uh, which was much more classical, but then he brought in these more dramatic works, and Edward II particularly, which he'd uh, originally done for Stuttgart Ballet, came into our rep, and it was a, a you know fantastic meaty roles to get involved in, and uh, so I think it, it, I was very lucky to be able to have those sort of roles, and I, I at that time, especially when David, I used to be so you want everything perfect as a dancer, and you know. It, it, it can't always be perfect. And I think at, at that age, I thought it was when, I don't know how old I was when David took over the company, um, maybe I was 30, probably 30. And I, I, something sort of changed. And I think doing those sort of roles where you're really living the character, you realize that, oh, if that one pirouette doesn't work, that's not as important as the whole performance. And I think I managed to be a little, enjoy it in a way more those last years um, because I was not so hung up on every technical aspect of it and just wanting the performance to be right. Do you think uh, by that time you were sort of, were you beginning to think perhaps even subconsciously about life after dancing? And I, for some reason I had in my mind that I would want to stop earlier than later. I think there was always that idea that you didn't want people hoping you were going to stop, you wanted people to be sad that you had stopped dancing and then um, I got an injury and I'd been very lucky throughout my career, I'd really had no injuries and, um, and I think that's sometimes not such a great thing because if you do have injuries you can have a little moment to 
rest and look how you're working and check that everything's in place and then you can start again whereas I was just pounding away for years and years and years and so uh, uh, I'm probably doing some things that I could have done some things better but uh, I in the end had really no cartilage left in one knee and hardly any in another so I had these big knee operations which I think some people thought I wouldn't get back from mm. anyway I was around mm. 33 but I used that time to um, to think about more what I, I wanted, I knew I wanted to get back, but I didn't know how long I'd last, so I used that time, and, and actually it's funny, Derek is here, but it, Derek having uh, been a dancer, and and then was then the, the chief executive of, of Birmingham, and so I, I remember going to talk to him, and he actually, at that time, suggested that I maybe go to Rombo and spend some time with Rombo Dance Company, just to see how another dance company runs because at that time I thought I'd like to be involved somehow in, in, in running a company and so I did that and then uh, then rehabbed and got back into shape but found it hard having been used to just being very reliable and being the person that could always do the show never off to every day wondering whether I was going to be able to do the show I that, that really began to make you think yes very so just before we, we move on to the next uh, phase of your, your career. Tell us about your final professional appearance on the stage. I think it was overseas, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, the, so I, I decided quite quickly to, that I was going to stop dancing and uh, the, the Hippodrome was going to be closed for, we didn't know how long actually, for a few years, at least a year and a half I think. And I was thinking, oh gosh, that's a long time. And, not that I have anything against Sunderland, but I just didn't fancy finishing my last show in Sunderland or somewhere like that. And uh, so I, I, we were going to New York and we were going to do Edward II and we were actually going to Chicago as well. And so I thought, this is the moment really to do it. This is, would be not much nicer to finish in New York with the principal role and, uh, and then also Chicago. So I, I did Edward II in New York and then we went to Chicago and we did a... Uh, the jazz triple bill that David did, which I was in Nutcracker Sweeties and um, the Shakespeare Suite, and so that was my last show actually in the uh, in uh, in the auditorium, massive massive place, and we had a band, a jazz band for Nutcracker Sweeties, and uh, it, they were quite riotous actually, and uh, so he decided to at the end of it, when we were taking our curtain calls, he stopped the applause, the band leader, and told the audience that you know, this was a very sad day, that I was retiring, <laughs> and that we should all get up and dance. And so at the end, the curtain was up, and they started playing jazz music, and the whole company were just dancing on stage with each other. So it's quite a send off. So you decide you're going to join management. Yes. So coach had turned gamekeeper, yes. in, in a way. Um, so how did you start off? With that, what, what was your first step in that? I was very lucky at BRB in that I was, a lot of people were very interested in, in helping people move on and tran uh, the transition. And there is the career development uh, fund as well, but actually BRB are very, very keen. They'd already started a degree program and they'd done lots of different things. And uh, I wasn't overly keen, I have to say, to go back to school. and uh, And... Uh, Jackie Mystery, who was the personnel director at the time, knew somebody at the Royal Shakespeare Company and she said, why don't you have an interview with them and maybe they will put together a sort of placement slash course for you in management and it would be good to get away from the ballet world and, and in somewhere else that you know, a world you know but that's different. And uh, so I went for an interview, literally I came off the plane from Chicago I, I don't know, I'd had the interview before, they said they would do something for me, so I came back from Chicago. Next day I was there in Stratford, and they devised time for me to be with all the different departments, so sometimes I would spend time with the budgeting, sometimes with the touring department. I worked on uh, the Tempest, uh, they used to have the other place there in, um, in Stratford, and then that moved to the pit at the Barbican, and then I worked on the Duchess of Duchess of Malfi that did a big tour around England and was on the main stage of the Barbican. It was just at that time when they were about to stop at the Barbican right. and also the coming to the end of uh, Adrian Noble's time and there was a lot of changes going on um, to do with 
management structures and uh, touring agreements and uh, technical agreements and it was probably a horrendous time for the company there, the Wall Street Group, but actually I had a brilliant time because I was learning so much all the time about how you put contracts together, how, how you put a tour together. I went to Budapest with The Tempest as well and it was really, it couldn't have been a better, everybody was so generous and uh, really op opened their world to me so that I could learn as much as possible. So now you're, you're, you've completed your training um, and you return to your old company, yeah. but um, with a different hat on. Mm -hmm. um, was that interesting? Had the company changed a lot in that, that short period you'd been away? Not really, but I think it was, I would always suggest to people, if you are going to do something like that, it's great to get away. Um, because I think uh, if I just somehow fallen into the job of company manager in Birmingham after having just, uh, just finished as a dancer, I think you probably wouldn't have got the respect, or, not the, or, or yeah, the respect of the dancers. I think they felt that I'd gone away, worked hard, got some training, and was ready to come back in this job, you know. And uh, but I was working with people, Derek, David Bintley, people that I I knew really, really well. So that was nice. But I was in a in a different role, you know. And uh, I loved it. I have to say, I loved the job of the company manager. And uh, it's it's right in the middle. You're supposed to be there for you're sort of making everything work, but for the for the management, but also for the dancers as well. And uh, you just uh, you're just across everything, and uh, it's a real think on your feet sort of job. But it's it's so in that respect, it's probably hugely helpful to have been a dancer. I mean, yeah. Did that? Do you think that gave them much more faith in you as 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 manager? I think so. I think so. I think they. Um, it, it, we never had a company manager. I don't think that been a dancer before in B in BRB, and I think it really they they I could. I could see their point of view, and when I'm organising things, work out how it should be and how it should uh, would work better for the dancers without compromising what we needed to do as a management. So I think I was able to see the balance of both sides, you know, and I, I even tried to bring that through now as well. So. And then in, in 2004, you moved to, to the Royal Ballet as company manager. manager. Big change, or just was that more of the same? Um, uh, no, it was quite different. Different culture. Yeah, different culture. Obviously, a much bigger company, and uh, a different way of of working, just management style as well. And uh, I really felt that I was constantly learning new things on the job there. And there was we at that point when I was company manager in Birmingham we hadn't really toured so much internationally so I was back doing that and so that was a huge chunk of work that I had never done before so yeah and and constantly things added like some, suddenly we started to film things and contracts had to be changed for for getting a media deal with the with the dancers and so suddenly everything was broadening out a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, so trying to learn as much as possible and Four and a half years later, you're appointed administrative director uh, of the Royal Ballet, and then last year, um, you're appointed director. It looks like a very smooth, um, almost inexorable rise to greatness and power. <laughs> <laughs> Was it? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's all happened by accident, really. You know, I mean, it just... It, uh, it happened by accident, <laughs> isn't that just one of the No, days. it did. Um, I, the administrative director thing, I, I just... Yeah, I've worked very closely then with Anthony Russell Roberts, who's been the administrative director for 20-odd um, years. And, uh, and so, towards the end, he was giving me more... more um, responsibility, I suppose. And uh, I think he was quite keen that I would be interested in going for this for the job, and so giving me as much experience as possible. And he was very generous with um, his time and, and and giving those projects to me. And so, um, though I hadn't gone in thinking, oh, that that would be the next step for me. Um, by the time the job came up, when Anthony was retiring, I felt I, I could give it a good go, and so went for it. And uh, 
the interview process is horrible, you know, and they really have to do it properly, and you go through all of those things. But uh, no, I was, and I enjoyed it very much. The, I was only there for two years, really, in that job. So um, yeah, no, I loved it, and uh, and then the job came up for director. So, so now you have one of the most important prestigious artistic jobs in the UK, perhaps even in the world. Uh, you're young. Um, yeah, you're now part of the establishment, yes. uh, Kevin. Uh, you're part of the great and the good. Um, how does that feel? It's making me clammy hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's odd because I think it's like in anything you never quite believe you're in this job or you're doing it, and uh, and it's much easier while you're doing it in a way. When exactly when somebody says that to you, you suddenly get you do feel well, your stomach goes or clammy. But but when you're in it, you're just enjoying it, and doing the best you can. I remember last year after I'd had the job, I'd got the job, but then. You know, obviously, there was a lot of things with Monica and the newspapers and on radio, and there was uh, a lovely interview she did, I think, with Norman Lebrecht, and I'd recorded it on the television. And one night um, before I went to bed, I thought, "Oh, I've never heard that thing with Monica. I'll play it." You know, and she started talking about the history of the company and this huge institution and Dame and Ned and what had been founded, and I just, you know couldn't sleep that night really thinking, <laughs> God, what is this, you know, how have I, what have I taken on? So when you stand away from it, you do think, gosh, it's a massive job and, and there's a huge responsibility. But when you're in there and you're all working together as a team to make, do the best possible job you can, then then it's fantastic. And I, I saw uh, at the time of your appointment uh, uh, an article, I think the headline was, uh, we've, we've got to talk about Kevin. Um, I think um, some people were surprised at your appointment, um, others, uh, I, I think many of us thought it seemed the most natural, natural appointment uh, in the world. Um, people did talk of you as being a safe pair of hands mm. for, for the company. Mm. Do you see yourself in that light? Not really. I didn't really know what they meant by a safe pair of hands. I mean, because whether they didn't know anything about me, I think I wasn't on the list. I, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't think when anybody was talking about who was going to be the next director, I don't think they mentioned my name. Um, so, yeah, and I, I think just the word administrator makes people think, oh, you're going to be a safe pair of hands. You know, you're going to be just worried about the money in the box office. And, and of course, that comes into what I think about. Um, but um, yeah, I just, I just want. Hopefully, I can see the the breadth of the company, and I, 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 I think because I've come from the Royal Ballet School all the way up through, and I know all the people that have, you know, I'm probably the last one of that who actually have been in rehearsals with Madam and Kenneth and Ashton just, you know, it was my first few years. You know, Madam to me seemed like a sweet older lady, you know, which of course, you know, another she generation was before was. <laughs> was never, you know, but because I was a boy and because I was Irish, you know, I was, uh, it, she was really lovely with, um, with both Michael and I. And so we always had that relationship. So I never saw her as that scary woman. Um, but um, but I think I suppose people thinking that because I knew all of that that I wouldn't want to push the company forward and I think you can't you've got to always push the company forward you can't um, just it's wonderful that we have such a brilliant heritage of Ashton and Macmillan and all these uh, the way we do the classics but we've got to you know, to keep it alive and to keep the dancers um, alive you've got to keep pushing forward as well and so. I have, I think we are on, we have, a, we're at a very lucky time. We've got these amazing choreographers around when maybe a while ago people felt there wasn't as many, mm. uh, as much choreographic talent, but to have, as we have now, Wayne McGregor, <coughs> Christopher Wielden and Liam Scarlett all creating and being part of the company, I think it's a very ex exciting time for the dancers. So. Absolutely. But of course, everything that you do now is sort of going to be in the spotlight. And, and, and this must be a, an agonizing sort of situation, because if you are going to be wanting to commission new works, um, you know, there's an element of, of risk and experimentation. And in, in a sense, one feels that people like you 
aren't, you know, you're always expected to be successful yes. and, and you're not expected to fail. Yes. Is that, does that play a part in your thinking about programming to the future? Uh, of course you want everything to be successful, but I mean, you know it can't be. Um, all you can do is, is support the work and, and make it the best it can possibly be and then it's for the audience and time to to decide whether that is a success or not. You know, we all know things like Manon, for instance, was not deemed a success when it first was created, and and it's taken a long time for that to become the classic it's become. And so, you do need time. You do need. Uh, you know, we're not. You know, we're just about to open Don Quixote, a new production at, at tomorrow night. And we have a week on stage, and that's it, you know. And you know, when you think of a play and a new or a new musical, they preview for weeks on end and and to get it right. And we just can't do that. It's, it just doesn't work in an opera house the way it can do in theatre. So things will develop, and that's that's the beauty. Of course, you want it as as good as possible on that first night, but it, it is about um, time and and giving the support and and nurturing. Um, what you're doing and what you're bringing forward. And of course we do tend to d define success as being good box office when it isn't necessarily. I mean, you, you, you may find you've got brilliant artistic success, but, but it hasn't got that much box yes. office. So. Yes, it is hard, but what's, what's interesting at the moment is that people are, seem to be, with for us anyway, willing to take the risk and, and, and come and see what, they're excited by seeing something new. So um, my one bit of showing off will be that we love. We just had the really last season. We're ninety six percent full for the whole season, and that includes all <laughs> all the triple bills and everything. So which is fantastic, you know. And the fact that people and again next this this coming season, it seems like people are interested to see what we're what we're doing. I mean, and there's a lot of interest in dance, which I think is great as well. You know, I'm a big fan of has been on anyway, you know, Darcy on Strictly, all of that, you know, it's brilliant and it helps to get dance out there and uh, so I think we're in a bit of a boom like the 80s were really, I think it's, <laughs> it dances out there everywhere and it's and we're very lovely. Really. Okay, we're, we're coming to the end of our, our session but I, I just want to, to look ahead a, 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 a little bit um, what your policy for the company might, might be. Um, I'm sure everybody is, is wondering about this. Um, commissions, three act ballets, very expensive, lot, lots of money, um, mix of classical, neoclassical, modern. What, what, what's the sort of feeling about where the company should go, where you would like to take it? Well, I think uh, you know, we have this enviable rep uh, of all the ballets that we have now, but I do think uh, we have to keep pushing forward. And I, it sounds a bit of a cliche now because I've said it a few times, but I am trying to create the classics for the 21st century so that we have a bigger pot to, to delve into when we're looking at our, our work and our rep. So once we, we had a big success with Alice in Wonderland, but that was the first full-length ballet we'd, we'd actually commissioned for about 17 years. And for lots of different reasons, the choreographers weren't interested in that sort of doing big narrative work like that. But now there's a change and a shift, and I really want to try and push that forward. So uh, together with, you know, doing, we have some great productions of the classics that I don't want to change, really, but we hadn't a Don Quixote, so we've put a Don Quixote into the rep. But within this season, we've got a new full-length um, ballet by Christopher Wilden, Winter's Tale. And I want to do more of that and keep going. And, and so probably for the next few years, you're going to see nearly every season a new full-length work. And some of them will work, some of them won't. And also bringing in uh, partners and collaborators from outside, people that we wouldn't um, generally have worked with in the past. And we're very lucky to have the Limbury Theatre as well. So we can really um, sort of experiment with that with either younger artists or established artists. So it's, it's putting all of that into the pot, and, but it, it is about being creative and taking some risks sometimes, but also giving our dancers the opportunities to do the roles that they want to do and what they train for. Because, you know, some people go, oh, gosh, you're doing Swan Lake if you're doing Swan Lake again. But we're, all our classical dancers train to do that or want to, want to be part of that as well. So it's getting that huge balance right. right. 
Uh, and of course, there will always be issues of funding. Uh, and I imagine a lot of your work is involved in bringing in sponsors and, mm -hmm. and winding and dining people. So it's, it's, you've got all that side as well yes. uh, to worry about. If you were um, to be granted one one wish, this is a complete <laughs> unfair sort of googly, but um, what what would your wish be for, for the company? No. <laughs> I think that's give you any notice yes, of this no. question. At the moment, I'd say a floor that they can dance on because we've got the problem with our liner for Don Quixote. But apart from that. <laughs> uh, uh, no, really for the dancers to really have happy and fulfilled and healthy careers. Really, that's to have that, to be lucky enough to be creatively fulfilled, but also physically to, to feel that you've got everything around you to make and give the best performances <coughs> you can possibly have. With That includes training, healthcare. So to be able to achieve that for those people, because I know it's a short career, and you want them to walk out having felt they've been given the best opportunity possible and that they are physically able to carry on in the rest of their lives. I think that would be a wish. I, I think that's a perfect note on which to end. The company seems to be in brilliant hands. Kevin O'Hare, thank you very, very much.